in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. I am delighted that you are here today to study the Word of God. I greet you who are watching via the uh, video, and I just pray God's blessings down upon all of you. Lord, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, oh, Father, how excited we are today to gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of the living God, we invite you to come and fill this place with your presence. Father, we ask you to come and to stand against every distraction, everything that would pull away our heart and our mind from the things of the Lord. Father, I'm asking that you give us the mind of Christ as we study the Word of God. Every one of us are in over our heads, Lord, and we need to get a word from you. Father, we are desperate to hear from you. We all know that we cannot live the Christian life apart from the power of God on our life and from the Word of God saturating our soul. So today, Father, we gather together as sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ around the foot of the cross, around the Word of God. And we are asking, Father, that you would come and meet here with us. We are asking, Spirit of God, that you would come and be our teacher and even our ears to hear with. That you would come and you would break the bread of life. That you would teach us till we are satisfied in you. That you would pour out your living water. That we, Father, might be blessed as we study your word today but beyond that we would be convicted if necessary and above all things that we would be changed that we would go forth from this place having known that we have had an authentic visitation with the Lord of glory understanding that we have been face to face in his presence Father, I pray when we go from this place, we'll be able to live out the truth we're going to be exposed to. Oh, Father, help us. Help us as we study the Word of God. We want to become godly women. We want to pursue the things of the Lord to walk worthy of our high calling in Jesus Christ. And, Father, as these precious mamas are endeavoring to train up their children in the way they should go, Lord, it is my earnest desire and prayer that I might point them to Jesus Christ, that I might point them to the Word of God. God, that they might be able to become partakers of your truth. They might be able to take these incredible, profound truths of the Word of God and make them practical to daily living. Now, Lord, as I come to share the message that is burning in my heart and soul, I'm asking, Father, that you would hide me behind the cross. That, Father, today I would lift high the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. So, Father, come now. Lord Jesus, come. Spirit of God, come with freedom and liberty in this place and speak truth to us. We are listening, Father. Our hearts are turned towards you, and we are expecting to get a word from you today. So come and do what only you can do. Help us, Father, in this journey that we might know the joy of Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless you and praise you today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the matchless name. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Oh, beloved, would you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Philippians. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Philippians. The title of the lesson today is, I've Got a Secret. Beloved, I want you to know that today, if you can get your arms wrapped around the truth that I'm going to be sharing with you today, it can revolutionize your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. I am telling you that I have got a secret. And if you will endeavor to allow the Spirit of God to impart this truth to you, I'm telling you it will change how you live the Christian life. Every one of you, every one of you desires to raise a child that will come to the early knowledge of Jesus Christ at the age of accountability and walk all of their days 
with the Lord. Amen? Is that not the truth? Every Christian mama wants to raise a child that loves God with all of their heart. Beloved, this is why you and I suffer under such angst about our mothering. Because we know there's so much at stake. I believe one of the keys to helping our children want and desire the life of Christ is for them to see authenticity in our lives, for them to see that we have the real thing. Well, Paul is writing this little letter to the uh, church at Philippi. It's a very short little letter he's writing back to them, and it is full of the theme of joy. And Paul, as he's writing this letter, interestingly enough, is under house arrest. He has been arrested by Rome for preaching the gospel. And he is being held in his own rented quarters for two years, chained all day long, 24 hours a day, to a Roman guard. He's unable to leave. He is being held on trumped-up charges. He does not know what the end of his defense will be. He could possibly be beheaded for it. He does not know if he will be set free, if he's going to have to serve a long prison sentence, or if he will ultimately be beheaded. So the fact that he is writing about joy is stunning because Paul, rather than writing to the Philippians saying, hey guys, get me out of here. Hey guys, find me a good lawyer and get me out of here. Hey guys, come and break me out of this place. He is writing to them about unspeakable joy in Jesus Christ. Beloved, this is very significant for us. Because you and I, although I am way now beyond where you are, I have released two ch uh, children into the adult world, but I can remember being in your shoes. I can remember what it was like thinking if I could just get a shower, if I could just, just brush my teeth, if I could just get in bed at a decent hour, if I could just sleep the whole night through, my children went five solid years without sleeping through the night. When Craig and I were first married, we had a very, 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 very tiny home. It was actually a cabin out in the woods. And because of that, my little guys shared a room. And because of that, whoever made a peep was immediately swooped up, and, and, and I would just have to get whoever was the offending crier out of the room, or I'd have both of those babies up. And so sleep became just something I longed for. I mean, it just, I, I just would give half my kingdom for just eight hours of uninterrupted sleep. So what I'm trying to explain to you is when Paul writes about joy in difficult circumstances, how many of you want that true in your life? Amen? Right here, right now with babies crying and toddlers and, and teens, you want to know joy. Well, I've got a secret for you. You can know the unspeakable joy of Jesus Christ regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how your child is acting, regardless whether you get a, a note home from the kindergarten teacher that says you need to deal with your child because he talks all the way uh, through story time we can't make him sit in his chair. I am telling you, you can have joy even when you find out at the last minute that your little second grader has volunteered to, you to make cupcakes for the whole second grade. You can have joy, beloved, when your adolescence rolls their eyes at you and declares under their breath that you are the worst mama in the whole world. You can have joy when your teenager sasses you and you think to yourself, I didn't deserve that. You can have joy, beloved, if you know Jesus Christ. Well, let's find out how we can experience joy in the journey. The first thing I want you to see is Paul's powerful prayers. Look with me in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul writes to the church at Philippi and to us as well by extension through the Holy Spirit, verse 3, I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. This is what I call powerful 
prayers. As Paul prepares to begin his correspondence back to the church at Philippi, he begins by telling them how grateful he is that from the very first they participated with him in the spread of the gospel. And then he begins to talk about how he prays for them. Beloved, if the apostle Paul prayed for you by name, I'm here to tell you, you got yourself prayed for. This was a man of unbelievable spiritual power. And he Here we see him saying, I am praying for you. And as I reflect and I think about you, my heart is moved with joy. And he begins to tell us what it is that he is praying for in the church. He reflects first of all on their participation uh, in the gospel. And he's so grateful that this is a a people that loves the Lord Jesus Christ, loves those within the body of Christ, but also has a heart for those outside the body of Christ. He goes on uh, to say, I'm offering this prayer uh, for you. Uh, Look down in... um Oh, let's see, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let let me me, uh, move back up there to verse uh, 3 again. He says, I thank my God every time I think of you. Now, that was not always the case with every church Paul ministered to. There were some people that he wept bitter tears over, like the Corinthians. There were some letters he had to write that were rather sharp and pointed, but the letter to the church at Philippians is full of encouragement. It's rather lighthearted for Paul, and he really only rebukes a situation where two women have begun uh, to fuss and uh, uh, fight together within the body of Christ. And so what Paul is saying is, when I think about you, my heart is full of joy. That is what I called his powerful uh, prayers. The second thing I want you to see is what I call his Christ-centered confidence. Look now with me in verse 6. Paul writes this, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it's only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. God is my witness, verse 8, how I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Verse 9, and I pray, this is his prayer for them, I pray that your love Love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Verse 11, have been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of Christ. What Paul is saying is I pray for you and this is what my heart's desire is for you. Now beloved as mamas, one of our greatest callings as a Christian mom is to become a faithful prayer warrior on behalf of our children. I cannot tell you there is no better investment of time other than studying the Word of God than to spend time agonizing in prayer over your children. Pray from them from them from the time they are first born. Pray for them. Pray that God will bring them to the early understanding of Jesus Christ. And at the age of accountability, they will receive Jesus Christ. Pray that they will walk all of their days in the ways of the Lord. Pray for the one that they will marry. When Craig and I first found out we were expecting Jason, we began to pray, even though we did not know if he was a boy or a girl, we began to pray for that baby that I was caring for his spouse. And nearly every day from then on, I prayed for the one who would be prepared to marry Jason and did the same thing with Dawson. Now, it's really interesting to me when Jason brought home uh, Patty Stresnicki, and this was the girl. This was the one that God had prepared. This was the answer to our prayers. And I can remember several months into the engagement of telling Patty that I want you to know that nearly every day since I found out I was expecting Jason, I've been praying for you. I'm going to have to stop and block forgive me, I have myself all lathered up. And I began to tell her about how God had impressed upon me to begin to pray for her, and I've just been dying for her to show up all these years. 
And I said, you're, one, you're my bonus baby. I didn't have to raise you. I didn't have to birth you. And just look at you. I've got this glorious, wonderful, godly young woman. And, and, and you're all ours. And I just count you as one of mine. But I did not raise you. But I did invest in prayer. Well, she went on as we were talking about it. And she said, you know what? I'm actually two years younger than Jason. And for two full years, I prayed for a child that had not yet been conceived. Now, the scripture teaches that God stores up our prayers in silver bowls in heaven. And I just love the idea of that. To think that all of those prayers, even though she hadn't been born yet, they were just being stored up there in heaven. And one day, at the proper time, God put those two together and the answer to our prayers was brought about. Isn't that exciting? You can pray in advance for what God wants to do in your child's life. One of the best things I know to do in prayer is to pray back scripture to the Lord. There are many prayers of Paul's recorded in the New Testament. And it's fabulous to just open the scripture. This is a very excellent example of one that you begin to pray Paul's prayers back to the Lord for your children, for your husband, for yourself. Beloved, any time that you pray God's word back to him, you can absolutely know you're praying within the will of God. In fact, you can use any scripture. I often go to the Psalms and I will pray through a psalm for one of my children or daughter-in-laws, for my husband or for my grandchildren. Pray the word of God. Become a prayer warrior. Paul said, I am praying for you. And I'm praying several very specific things for you. I want your love to abound. And I want it to abound, look at this, in real knowledge and in all discernment. Beloved, you and I need to learn that what God's standard is so that we can begin to align our lives according to his standard. You and I can never live out the Christian life until we first know it. Do you understand that? You have to take it in, learn it, process it before you can ever begin to live by it. And so he's saying, I hope your love will just abound, but not just sentimentality. Uh, I don't want you to be naive. I don't want you to be unwise. I want your love to abound according to knowledge and discernment. I want you to be wise when you give away your love. I want you to be wise when you develop friendships. Beloved, not every person that shows up in your life has been put there by God. Some are toxic relationships that the enemy has put there. And so he's saying you're not to just love aimlessly, carelessly. You're to love according to knowledge. You're to love according to discernment. Not only that, he said, I want you to learn how to prove the things that are excellent. Listen to me. Paul himself said that all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. Beloved, one of the roles as mama is to be able to discern between the best and the better. The enemy will get you and I busy pursuing good things to keep us from pursuing the best things. Not everything is expedient. Not everything moves me forward in my Christian life. It may be lawful, that is, it's not something against the law, but it may be something that will steal or rob my testimony or my time. You see, as a mama, I wanted to live such a holy life. I decided I was going to err towards holiness on any of the gray areas. I'm talking about the things that are not firmly uh, dealt with in Scripture. I'm talking about the gray areas. I determined that I was going to always err to the side of caution and holiness. Do you want to know why? Because I had two little boys I knew was watching every move I was making. Now, this is not always the, the case, but it often is. What you and I tend to do in moderation, our children tend to do in excess. Let me say that again. It's not always the, ca the case, but it is often the case that what you and I do in moderation, what you and I open the door a crack to, our children tend to do in 
excess. It's not always the case. But I am telling you, you and I have every reason to fear the testimony that we are living before our children because it is going to impact them the rest of their lives. So Paul said, I want your love to abound, but according to knowledge and discernment. Not only that, I want you to be able to approve of those things that are excellent. And those things that are excellent, I want, you to, I want you to just pour your life into those because those are the things that will matter for all eternity. And then he said, I want you to be filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ. I want your life to be full of the fruit of the Spirit. I want your life to count in this life and in the next. I want you to be busy laying up treasure in heaven where the moth cannot get to, where the thief cannot get to, where rust cannot decay. I want you living a life that is going to guarantee that in this life you are blessed, in the next life you are rewarded. That's what he's saying. And beloved, again, to who is this more important than a mama who has built-in disciples that are taking notes on our lives? From the moment we identify ourselves with Jesus Christ, we give our children the right to see what Jesus looks like in, when he is inhabiting humanity. We give them the right to see what God is like as they look at our lives. Tall order, heady stuff. How do you do it? I got good news. I can tell you. I have a secret. I can tell you. How's that for good news? That was worth getting up and coming this morning for. First of all, we see that Paul shares his prayer life with us. Secondly, we begin to see that he is teaching us about the confidence he has in a Christ-centered life. Yesterday, I was able to keep uh, our youngest grandson, Grayson. And I know you're dying to see him. And so, uh, Catherine, if you can put up those pictures for me. I just brought a couple of pictures. This is our, our little doll baby. And if you could see what my heart looks like if it were on the outside of my body, this is it. Uh, this is Grayson. He is seven months old. He is the joy of his JJ and Papa's life. He is beginning to say, Mama, I'm working with him on JJ. Uh, he is so much fun. He is the happiest little thing. He is the baby of Catherine and Dawson. Dawson's our youngest son. And uh, I, 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 I'm, the, her family might not agree, but I'm just telling you, when my son was this age, that's exactly what he looked like. Uh, and really and truly, he has Dawson's personality. Very laid back child, very, very easy. I have another picture of him, Catherine. And now, you know that's just yummy cute right there. That's just yummy, yummy cute. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, that is just cute. That is just cute. I'm telling you, when he comes to... Uh, when he comes to my house, he knows the camera is coming out. And so uh, I've taken lots and lots of pictures about him. Well, I want to tell you a story about not, this is Grayson, the youngest one, but uh, Declan. Now, the next picture, uh, this is Jason Patty's baby, Declan. And he is uh, 18 months old. And this child, again, uh, perhaps her family wouldn't agree with me, but uh, they're not here to dispute it. I'm just going to tell you that when Jason was this age, down to the curls, this is exactly what he looked like. This, uh, like Dawson's baby, is very phlegmatic like his daddy. This child is very sanguine like his daddy. And he uh, spoke early, and he has a huge vocabulary, and uh, he is the cutest little thing. Well, yesterday, or excuse me, last week he came over to my house. And Catherine, I'm going to slow you down uh, right there. Right there. This is where I want to uh, tell my story. Um, he was over at my house playing. It was just the two of us. Uh, uh, Craig had been there with us, and we had been having a big, large time. But um, uh, we uh, were going to sit down and try to get him settled for a little bit of a nap. And uh, so when I got him settled into the, uh, to the couch with me and had his blanket and everything, he said to me that he wanted to watch hot chocolate. Well, I immediately knew that what he was talking about was the movie Polar Express. I also knew that I had bad news for this kid because while I had recorded that for him during the holidays and I, he had watched it at my house, I had let the TiVo bump that off. Now, if I had thought about it, I would have known better than that, but I did not. 
So when he began to say that what he really wanted to watch was not the backyardigans that I had TiVo'd for us or any other uh, series of things that I had for us to watch, he wanted that one particular show, which he called Hot Chocolate. Now, I began to try to explain to this child who's not yet two that J.J. did not have hot chocolate. And uh, at first, this was okay, and he would patiently listen to me as I would try to explain. You see, I had it on the TiVo, uh, but then I, I let it slip away, and I don't have that. And he would nod and nod, and then he would take the remote, and he would push it over at me, and he would say, hot chocolate. And I would go through my little story again. And so this is the way he started. Now, if you'll show the next one, this is the way it began to go. And I began to try to explain him now with more enthusiasm about how I had some things for us to watch, but not Polar Express. You'll see how this began to deteriorate. Uh, if you'll show the next one, Catherine, aha. Uh -huh. And I'm still trying to explain to him. I'm doing the best I can here, but I'm just so sorry. I can't seem to make you understand. I don't have the hot chocolate. And so by now he's saying it every breath. Hot chocolate, hot chocolate, hot chocolate. And he is moving the remote over to me, pushing it farther and farther. And I'm saying, yes, honey, but I don't have the hot chocolate. And if you'll show the last one, you'll see, oh, this did not end well, did not end well. Now, this is my point. I could not make him understand what I was trying to explain. I'm going to try to do better with you today. I'm going to tell you that I've got a secret. I can tell you how, beloved that you can live in the joy of the Lord regardless of what is going on in your life. And I'm not talking about something you manufacture. I am talking about allowing the joy of the Lord to permeate your life regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the fact that your child is throwing a temper tantrum in Walmart and security is being called, regardless of the fact that the teacher sends home a note and needs to talk to you privately about a situation developing at school, regardless of the fact that your teen breaks curfew, regardless of the fact that your teen calls and they have just wrecked your car, regardless of the fact that your teen uh, begins to uh, complain and gripe about the rules that, and regulations of this home and thinks everybody else in the whole world has better parents than you, regardless of of your circumstances, I am telling you that God has so ordained for you and I to live in Christ that we can have exuberant, hilarious, abundant joy regardless of the circumstances. So I want to share with you the secret to abiding in joy. Paul is, there's no one better to teach us about it than the Apostle Paul because he is right now incarcerated, unable to leave his rented quarters. He, now, I'm telling you, when you teach so hard and fast that your jewelry just falls off, you need to back it up. And I, I, I wish I could slow it down, girls, I do. Even in my own head, that voice is saying, stop, slow down, slow down, they're not going to get it. But I talk really fast. I have a lot to tell you. I want you to understand that because of what Jesus has done for you and for me, we are able to live in outrageous joy. And when you and I live in that life realm, when you and I live in the supernatural realm of the presence of the Lord so much that His life is just expressed through us, we give our children an appetite for the things of the Lord. Now you hear me and you hear me well. We cannot believe for our children. There will come a day you can't even make your children behave right much less believe right you get a 16 year old boy in your house and I'm telling you he's going to be bigger than you you're not going to be able to make him behave right you're not going to be able to make your child 
believe right. But there's much you and I can do to give them an appetite for the things of the Lord by allowing them to see authenticity, reality in our lives. By allowing them to see that in the midst of crisis, of trial and testing, we can rise above it all and we can live in perfect peace and the joy that Jesus Christ provides. So here we have Paul who's sitting in a, basically a, not a jail cell, but in an, a, his rented room, his rented house, and he is under guard. He is chained to this guard, and yet he is writing to us about living a life of such joy. And he says, I am confident of this one thing, that he who has begun, I'm in verse 6, chapter 1, he who has begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Beloved, this is the key. This is the secret. That what God has begun in you and I, He will perform and perfect. I believe that all of us understand that we were born in sin. All of us understand that in Adam all died. And we were born dead in our transgressions and our sins. Ephesians chapter 2 said that we were living under the power of the prince of the air, Satan himself. And that we were indulging our mind and the lust of our flesh, we were living in sin. But God was rich in mercy and he did not leave us in our sin. He made a way of escape through Jesus Christ. And so what happened is at a point in time we heard the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. And our soul began to be awakened to the truth that we were a sinner in need of a Savior. And we reacted by mixing belief and faith and we were gloriously everlastingly saved. That is what we call salvation. But let me tell you. This is the part that most Christians don't seem to understand. There are three aspects of our conversion experience. Two of them happen instantaneously and one is progressive. The first thing that happens is what we call justification. At the moment of our conversion, instantaneously, when we invited Christ into our heart and into our life, immediately, instantaneously, we were everlastingly saved. At that instant, at that very instant, our name was written in the Lamb's book of life. At that instant, our spirit, our human spirit, which had been dead because of our sin nature, at that instant, it was quickened and made alive, and the Holy Spirit of God moved into our human spirit. The very core of our being, he moved in. Whether you understood this all or not, I'm telling you, at that instant, a lot of things happened. We call it justification. We exchanged our sinfulness for Christ's righteousness. The scripture says, He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you and I, at that very moment, exchanged our sin for His righteousness. That's called justification. But beloved, that is just the first part of our salvation. That's just the first part. And that was instantaneous. The th last part, the third part, is called glorification. It is also instantaneous. The scripture teaches that at the moment we see Jesus Christ, we are going to be made like him. We don't know what all that entails, but we know at that moment we're going to be like Jesus. And so at that moment when we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, either through the rapture of the church or if we step in to heaven through the portal of death, we're going to be instantaneously changed into his image. Now stay with me. The first is justification. That's the first phase of our salvation. The last is glorification. The last phase of our, uh, sanct or, excuse me, of our salvation. Both of those are instantaneous. But it is what happens from the first moment unto the last that most Christians don't understand. They think that because those two things are instantaneous, those two things are automatic, they think the thing that happens to them from between justification and glorification is automatic as well. And I'm here to tell you, it is not. It is not. It is progressive in a process called sanctification, 
which happens between justification and glorification, that you and I are changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not automatic. Beloved, if it was, every Christian would become a mature believer. And we know experientially that is not the case. I've got to stop and blot again. Excuse me, forgive me. It is warmish up under these lights. I am here to tell you that that process called sanctification, it is available to you, but it is not automatic. The first two, or excuse me, the first one and the last one God does for us. The second, this process called sanctification, beloved, he expects us to rise up and be active participant in this process of sanctification where you and I are changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, how does that process happen? It is not automatic. It is not automatic. The mature Christian life, a life of victory, a life of joy in the journey that is available to you is absolutely yours by birthright. But, beloved, you have to do the work to receive it. Do you get that? This is the secret. This is the secret. If you do not actively engage in studying the scripture, if you choose not to be actively involved in renewing your mind with the word of God, you will live the Christian life with a saved soul and a wasted life. Do you get that? Do you see what I'm talking about? You will live the Christian life redeemed and on your way to heaven with a mind that has been unregenerated. And you will make decisions based on exactly what you did prior to your conversions. Now, does this make sense to you? This is what's wrong with the church. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Because we have Christian believers hanging around between justification and glorification, thinking that God is automatically renewing their mind and changing them from glory to glory, and he is not. And there will be many believers with a saved soul, but a wasted life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Beloved, what you and I must understand, that at the moment of justification, we are ushered into a phase called sanctification, whereby you and I are, begin, are to begin to study, to show ourselves approved. Now, most Christians believe that it's simply enough to come to church a couple of times a week and hear some good preaching, and they think that is enough to gradually change them into the image of Jesus Christ. And beloved, it is not. It is not. And so what we have is many in the body of Christ that are very immature in the faith. Why? Because they do not understand that this process called sanctification requires of them to become a student of the Word of God. And that cannot be done, beloved, simply by being exposed to good, hard preaching. Now, I love me some good, hard preaching. I am telling you, I love conviction better than anybody. I love hard preaching. I like to sit close to the front. And I'm just like, bring it, brother. Just come on. Just come on and bring it. I love good Bible teaching. For 15 years, my husband was my Bible teacher. And he knows the Word of God. And I'm uh, delighted to sit under his teaching. He's taking a sabbatical now. But I'm telling you, I have exposed myself to good Bible preaching and good Bible teaching. I hope you'll do the same, and your children as well. But that in and of itself, beloved, it's an important part of our Christian life. The Scripture says don't uh, fail to be there to assemble with the body of Christ. However, if that's all you ever do is expose yourself to good, hard preaching and good, hard Bible teaching, but you never become a student of the Word, I will tell you that you will live by the parameters of the Word of God, but you will never know the power of God on your life. This is why I am convinced we are losing the next generation at an alarming rate because they are being raised in homes of people who week in and week out trot them off to church, but the reality of the life is not being progressively changed because they've been deluded into thinking it's enough, and it is not. It is not. 
Beloved, if you're going to hand down a living faith to your children, if you are going to give them a hunger and thirst for righteousness, if you're going to see them hunger after the things of God, they've got to see it in you. They've got to. Our beloved, they are not going to believe it's worth the work, and it is. But you listen to me. It is work. It is an investment of time and energy to study to show yourself approved. To study on your own the Word of God. That's why we built this program to require you to get into the Scripture. Because that is when the life is changed. When the mind is renewed by the Word of God. And dipping in and dipping out on a weekend basis at church, it's not enough. It is not enough. Some statistics are saying that among evangelicals, we are losing our next generation at the rate of 85%, and most of them are not being regathered back to the Lord. Beloved, what's wrong with us? Our kids are seeing such lackluster Christianity lived out in most of our believers' lives, and it sickens them they want no part of it. What Paul is talking about is living in the presence of the risen God to such a degree that that inner life of joy is just spilling over and splashes of joy. The overflow of his devotional life, the overflow of his study is just spilling out on everybody around him. Beloved, that's what Paul is talking about. Not a joy we manufacture, not a joy we hope for. I'm telling you, it's a joy of Jesus. Just being in his presence, knowing him, spending time in his word, memorizing the scripture, meditating on it, asking God to teach us what does that mean in my life, asking him to show us, now how can I put this in my child's life? How can I teach them? How can I show them this is what I'm learning in the word of God and this is how I'm living it out? Beloved, that is the way. That our children begin to see that what we have, it's the real deal. We're not playing church. Beloved, if you could only understand the reality of the enemy that's coming against the home, the world, the flesh, the devil, all of that. The goal of the enemy is to snatch our children from the faith. He hopes he can destroy your home and in the process take your children in unbelief. The way you and I combat that is we live a life that simply cannot be explained apart from Jesus Christ. And beloved, weekend uh, church attendance, and again, I hope you are actively involved in your church. I hope you're regular attenders. I hope that you faithfully take your family and your children and you expose them to good teaching and preaching. But beloved, that in and of itself, it's not enough to experience the fullness of joy in Jesus Christ. Paul said, I am convinced that God who began this work, justification, will complete it, sanctification, until the day of the Lord, glorification. I don't want to meet Jesus and have to apologize for her wasted life. I decided years ago, regardless of the cost, these little boys were worth doing the work. I decided years ago I wanted a life that was changed. I wanted a life that was transformed. I did not want an average ordinary life. I wanted a life that counted for the kingdom. And I began to study out the word of God. There is no better investment of our time than to study the word of God. Cooperate in this process called sanctification. Become more like Jesus Christ through the study of of the word through the renewing of the mind so that we are ultimately having our behavior change so we are beginning to look like Jesus Christ oh beloved it is worth doing the work well we've seen Paul's prayers and we've seen his Christ uh, centered confidence and I want you to see the very last thing is what I call father filtered faith 
Look with me now in chapter 1 and verse 12. And now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have actually turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known through the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now this is what was happening. Uh, Caesar wanted to stop Paul from preaching, so he arrested him, and he put him under house arrest. He thought that was going to stop Paul. But what he did not know is he was going to actually bring the gospel to the very heart of Caesar's empire. What happened was Paul was being kept under guard by the Praetorian Guard. That was the elite. They would sort of be like the, the Secret Service. And they were being a, a, a chained to Paul 12-hour shifts, 24 hours a day. And what was happening is they were witnessing the power of God upon Paul's life. And Paul was building a relationship with each one of these guards as they were chained to him. And he was sharing Christ with them. And they were beginning to see the reality of Christ in his life they were beginning to see the kind of joy I've been talking about and they were beginning to be saved by droves and the very thing that Caesar intended to do that is stop the gospel backfired and the gospel ended up, ended up being spread throughout Caesar's household and commentators tell us that many many of his household servants and slaves and soldiers heard the word of God because of Paul's imprisonment and many of them were gloriously saved this is what I've been trying to teach you today is I have a secret if you want a life that is going to count for Jesus Christ, if you want to live in a realm different than the average Christian, you can, beloved, you can. But you must renew your mind by the word of truth. You must allow the word of God in the washing of the water of the word to begin to transform your mind from that unregenerate mind that you got saved with into a mind that is fixed on the things of the Lord. Memorize the scripture, meditate on the scripture. I was given by my husband a, a beautiful coach watch a few years ago. It was when I realized that I suddenly was losing my fine tuning and I could not read the face of my watch and so my husband and the boys gave me a beautiful coach watch for Christmas one year, and it had a great big face to it. And uh, after I had worn it for about a year, uh, the battery quit on it. And I took it to my jeweler and asked him to put a new battery in it. Now, my jeweler is a, Ro uh, is a Russian immigrant, and he speaks with a very heavy accent. And I always try to listen to him very closely so that I don't have to ask him to repeat, my repeat himself. I handed him my watch, and I told him I thought it needed a new battery. And he said something to me I did not quite get, and I finally said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. And he sort of waved me off with his hand, and he said, no, no, no bothers. When I open up the watch, I'll be able to tell if it's the real deal or not. When I get in on the inside, when I see what's on the inside, I will know if it is real. Beloved, this is what the world needs to see. This is what our children need to see, that Jesus Christ is real. He is real. He is real to us, and he is worth doing the work so that we can have joy in the journey. They need to see that what we have is the real deal. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, how grateful I am for the Word of God. Lord, I know in my own life that study of the Word of God, of God has produced change in my life. So, Father, I'm asking for these sweet mamas that you would give them a hunger to know the truth of the Word, that you would bless them, Father, and give them a desire to study, to show themselves approved, that they would commit themselves to the study, the memorization, the meditation, of the Word of God, that they would be careful to live in such a way that their children can see the reality of Christ, that they would walk worthy of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray as these women get into the Word of God that you will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will speak to them. You will teach them of your truth. You will teach them how to take the profound things of the Word of God and make it practical in their lives. Father, I pray you would bless them. You would encourage them. You would use them to draw their children to Jesus Christ. You would use them as a faithful witness in their home if they have a lost husband. You would use them to lead their little ones to Jesus Christ. Christ, you would use them 
as an example of a woman who loves Jesus Christ. You would use them, Father, as an example of one whose heart is so fixed on Jesus Christ that her life is full of the joy of the Lord. The scripture says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Father, would you make that so in every one of our lives? Father, we hunger and thirst after you. Would you bless us as we study the word of God together week after week? And would you bring about that process of sanctification and change in our life more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ? Lord, we bless you and we praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Ladies, I'll see you next week.